April 1637, Amsterdam. Two months after the tulip crash, buyers and sellers are still fighting it out in the courts, and pamphlets about the tulip mania are everywhere. People read them aloud in taverns, buy them on street corners, and pass them around social functions. Tulip trading was immoral, they say, unchristian, even pagan. Some suggest the whole thing stemmed from a dark cabal who controlled the market, made their money, and then crashed the price. Others say the tavern colleges engaged in price fixing or intentionally drove up auctions. A few even claim individual sellers had been counterfeiting tulips, passing off lesser bulbs as more valuable ones. The tulip mania may be over, but the reaction to it will be a full-blown mania in and of itself. This episode was made possible by the brand new Nebula classes, which I am super pumped to tell you about after this episode, because I made one! When the court of Holland threw up its hands and told cities to sort out the problem of tulip lawsuits for themselves, it did, at least, give some directions for doing so. And most cities followed that model. Contracts made after a certain date were cancelled outright, and both lawyers and notaries were instructed not to make any more contracts involving tulip trading. And buyers who agreed on purchasing tulips with promissory notes could be released from them by paying a percentage of the contracted price. But how big should that percentage be? Well, instead of fighting it to death in the courts, most cities recognized that this was essentially a neighborhood problem. Friends trading with friends. So cities told the claimants they should settle out of court using arbitration if necessary. And for the vast majority of these cases, this actually worked, with payments averaging between 3.5 and 10% of the promised amount paid in easy installments. It was a very uncapitalist solution to a capitalist problem, one that harkened back to earlier economic systems that prized civic harmony over individual wealth an attitude that helped prevent the mania from becoming a full-on financial crisis. But there was another form of crisis brewing around the tulip mania, one over moral and social norms. See, even though the Dutch Republic was the most advanced economy in the world, capitalism itself was still fairly new and hadn't yet fully meshed with Protestant thought. How was it in keeping, for example, to be charitable and love thy neighbor when you held a debt over their head? Money gained via investment still seemed a bit dirty, and Calvinist ideas of hard work tended to distrust tales of people getting rich overnight. As a result, an enormous amount of criticism descended on the bulb trade before the crash even occurred, mostly taking form in cheaply printed pamphlets, occasionally decorated with a crude woodblock print that called the bulb traders fools and depicted them wearing jester's caps. And to reach the maximum number of people, they were often written in the form of a two-person dialogue so they could be read aloud like plays in taverns. And since the pamphlet authors were part of the Dutch upper class, they also often featured their share of snooty class critique. After all, traders like those who worked at the Amsterdam stock market were supposed to be a certain class of wealthy. But with tulips, artisans and the middle class, those with no other avenue for investment, were also getting in on the action. And worse, they were at least, on paper, succeeding. So what did that mean? These weavers and tavern keepers could suddenly make money from buying and selling? Why that would suggest a social mobility that the upper class simply wasn't comfortable with. So it's unsurprising that in those little plays, the protagonists end up going back to their trades in hopes of eventually earning enough to pay off their debts. However, another type of pamphlet criticized the tulip mania itself as irreligious and a form of idol worship. And to get this across visually, they found the perfect symbol, the Roman goddess Flora, a deified former courtesan who happened to be both the patron goddess of flowers and sex workers. These pamphlets argued that Flora was bewitching and enticing, but also greedy and fickle, leaving her worshippers with nothing. It was such a perfect metaphor for the crash that a series of paintings and prints about the mania featured Flora as a central figure. One entitled Ship of Fools shows her aboard a cart with a sail on it that foolish tradesmen are following as it wheels into the sea where they all drowned. These types of paintings also tended to use monkeys as a metaphor for foolishness, with hordes of the animals pooping on tulip traders and whizzing all over their bulbs. Yeah, just an FYI, a lot of classical painting is not as highbrow as you might think. Inevitably, a few tulip traders tried to fight back. One connoisseur published a rebuttal asking people to please not confuse the high-end traders with the common rabble at the colleges, but it didn't really work. The story, distortions and all, had already passed into legend. But what's really interesting about these critical pamphlets is that they're nearly the only documents on the tulip mania that survive. It's from them we get attitudes, pricing information, and even how the colleges worked. This is where we get the stories of sad, bankrupt traders, and tulip contracts traded ten times a day, and early historians drew on them as if they were completely accurate. Which brings us right back to the guy we met in episode one, Charles McKay, and his 1841 book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. 
Now, it's a good read, well-written, often funny, and gives you all the witchcraft trials, crusades, economic bubbles, and relic worship you could possibly want. Plus, its chapter on the tulip mania introduced the event into popular culture. The problem is, it's completely inaccurate. McKay was a journalist, not a historian. He wasn't interested in fact-checking, he just wanted a bestseller, and he was willing to flat-out make stuff up to keep things interesting. Not to mention, he was also a plagiarist. He stole the chapter on the tulip mania from another author, whose book was based almost entirely on those pamphlets critical of the mania. In other words, the image most of us have of the tulip mania today comes from a sensationalized book chapter ripped off from another book, which in turn was based on one-sided and probably inaccurate broadsheets. This all blew up the tulip mania to be much larger and more significant than it was, to the point that the current idea of the tulip mania itself is full circle an extraordinary popular delusion. Oh, and by the way, for all of McKay's sneering about illogical behavior, he egged on people during the British railway bubble, which unlike the tulip mania, did cause an actual financial crisis, so you know, glass houses. The truth is, after the tulip mania, connoisseurs continued to trade tulips at high prices. A few growers did go out of business, but the market stabilized, partially because, as news of the tulip mania spread, it created a mental link between tulips and the Netherlands. Dutch tulip growers were soon exporting to neighboring countries, and even the Ottoman Empire. And though the growing methods and preferred types of tulips changed significantly over time, it's still going strong. About 60% of commercial flowers today are grown in the Netherlands, and the tulip fields remain a major tourist attraction. And our mania for tulips and other flowers really didn't end. A fad for hyacinths stormed through the Netherlands a generation later, and France had a wave of bulb buying. Turns out, flowers are just, in general, desirable and expensive things, and new varieties or imports get people excited. In fact, another tulip craze swept the Ottoman Empire during the reign of Sultan Ahmed III, driven by his personal interest in and love for the flower. Between 1718 and 1730, an era in history now called the Tulip Period, it appeared everywhere, and demand for the flower shot up with common people buying them and the elite collecting rare specimens. However, the Ottoman government did learn from the previous tulip mania and stepped in to set prices before things got out of hand. Then the last major craze for flowers occurred in China in 1985, when prices for a specific red lily went through the roof. And actually, full disclosure, we've caught a bit of the tulip mania ourselves. While researching it, Rob found himself standing in front of a flower shop display, wondering if he should bring his daughter home some tulips. And Allie, whose wonderful illustrations you've been seeing in this series, decided to try to grow some for herself. Because here's the thing about tulips. They're just flowers. Pretty flowers, sure. But it's the stories we tell about them that give them their worth. Neither Rob nor Allie thought much about them before working on this series. But once a story made them notice the tulip, they wanted some. And the same can be said for Beanie Babies, limited edition sets, Rolexes, celebrity autographs, NFTs, or even in vogue health foods like quinoa and kale. Something's only worth what you're willing to pay for it. So, if there's a takeaway from the tulip mania, I think it might be this. Oftentimes, value is subjective, emotionally driven, and varies from person to person. After all, we're all maniacs for something. Me personally, I've always been obsessed with working in entertainment, though to be honest, my path from interning at MTV all the way to show running and narrating a YouTube channel was full of lessons I wish I'd learned earlier. Which is why I am so excited to tell you about my talk over on Nebula Classes. Nebula Classes is a brand new part of Nebula, our creator-owned streaming platform we've been building with a ton of our other creator friends like Jordan Harrod and Tirzu. And in my talk, How to Be Ready for Your Dream Job, I get to go over a ton of things I wish I knew earlier in my career, in the hopes that anyone starting out in the entertainment industry can leverage that info and won't have to make the same boneheaded mistakes that I made. The class is fully produced by me and the Nebula team, and I am just so extremely proud of how it turned out, I can't wait for you to see it. In fact, I had so much fun that when I told Jeff about it, he decided he wanted to make a class on the best practices for video game design and production, which is going to come out in a few months. Though it's not just us. We've recently launched with classes from Amy Nolte, Thomas Frank, Sam from Wendover, Devin from Legal Eagle, and more, including exclusive classes from the team over at Bright Trip. And the coolest part is, new classes drop every week, led by your favorite creators and experts in their field. Plus, since Classes is part of Nebula, you'll also get access to all of the exclusive and ad-free content from Nebula creators, as well as some awesome originals like Battle of Britain from Real Engineering and Modern Conflicts from Real Life Lore. Ooh, and you can watch these and over 10,000 other videos just about anywhere with our iPhone, iPad, Android, Android TV, Apple TV, and Roku apps. And all of what I just talked about is just $10 per month or $100 per year. But if you visit our link below, you can sign up for the discounted price of just 8 bucks per month or 80 bucks per year. And if you're already a Nebula subscriber, thanks for that by the way, upgrading to classes is just an extra 5 bucks a month. That's a lot of learning at a little price. 
The most legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Kyle Murgatroyd.